Okay, welcome back. So, we will discuss about insulin therapy in diabetes mellitus. Exogenous insulin is needed when insulin is inadequate to meet specific metabolic needs. People with type 1 diabetes requires exogenous insulin to survive and may need multiple daily injections of insulin, often four or more or continuous insulin infusion via an insulin pump to adequately control blood glucose levels. People with type 2 diabetes may require exogenous insulin during periods of severe stress such as illness or surgery. In addition, because type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease, over time, the combination of nutritional therapy, exercise, and other agents may no longer adequately control blood glu glucose levels. At that point, exogenous insulin would be added as a permanent part of the management plan. Genetically engineered human insulin is made in labs. The insulin is derived from common bacteria, example Escherichia coli, or E cells through recombinant DNA technology. Insulins differ by their onset, peak action, and, and duration and are categorized as rapid acting, short acting, intermediate acting and long acting insulin. The base of all insulin preparation is regular insulin. The onset of activity peak and duration times are manipulated by adding zinc, acetate buffers and protamine. The zinc and protamine added to make intermediate acting NPH can cause an allergic reaction at the injection site in susceptible individuals. This is a self-explanatory visual regarding the different types of insulins. Basal bolus regimen. The insulin regimen that most closely mimics endogenous insulin production in the body is the basal bolus regimen. Rapid or short-acting insulin boluses before meals and intermediate or long-acting basal background insulin once or twice a day. Intensive insulin therapy consisting of multiple daily insulin injections together with frequent self-monitoring of blood glucose. The goal here is to achieve a near normal glucose level of 70 or 130 before meals. To control post-meal blood glucose level, the timing of administration of rapid and short-acting insulin in relation to meals is crucial. The rapid-acting synthetic insulin analogs include Lispro, Aspart, and glu Glulosin. They have an onset of action of approximately 15 minutes, should be injected within 15 minutes of meal time and this most closely mimic natural insulin secretion in response to a meal. The short acting insulin, the onset is 30 to 60 minutes and preparation should be injected 30 to 45 minutes before a meal to ensure that the onset of action coincides with meal absorption. Because of the timing of 30 to 45 minutes, before meal, it is difficult for people to incorporate into their lifestyles and so most people prefer the rapid acting insulins with meals. Short acting insulin is also more likely to cause hypoglycemia because of a longer duration of action. In addition to mealtime insulin, people with type 1 diabetes must also use a long acting basal or background um, insulin to control blood glucose level in between meals and overnight. Within, without a 24-hour background insulin, people with type 1 diabetes are more prone to developing diabetic ketoacidosis. Many people with type 2 diabetes who use mealtime insulin injections or oral medications also require basal insulin to adequately control blood glucose levels. Insulin glargine or lantus and detmer or long-acting insulin that are released steadily and continuously and for most people do not have a peak of action. Although they are typically used for once daily subcutaneous administration, detrimer can be given twice daily because they lack the peak 
action time, the risk for hypoglycemia from this type of insulin is greatly reduced. Do not mix dilute glargine or detmer with any other insulin or, or solution in the same syringe. Intermediate acting insulin NPH is also used as a basal insulin. Its action has a duration of 12 to 18 hours. The disadvantage of NPH is that its peak of action ranges from 4 to 12 hours which can result in hypoglycemia. NPH is the only basal insulin that can be mixed with short and rapid acting insulins. NPH is a cloudy insulin that must be gently agitated before administration. For patients who want to use only one or two injections per day, a short or rapid acting insulin is mixed with intermediate acting insulin in the same syringe. This allows patients to have both mealtime and basal coverage without having to administer two separate injections. Although this may be more appealing to the patient, most patients achieve better control with basal bolus therapy. Patients may mix the two types of insulin themselves or may use a commercially premixed formula or pen. This is a chart regarding the mixing of insulin and administration of insulin. Please note the um, steps um, to avoid the long, the intermediate acting insulin to get into the regular insulin. Storage of insulin. As a protein, insulin requires special storage considerations. Heat and freezing alter the insulin molecule. Insulin vials and insulin pens currently in use may be left at room temperature for up to four weeks unless the room temperature is higher than, higher than 86 degree Fahrenheit or below freezing less than 32 degree Fahrenheit. Unopened insulin vials and insulin pens should be stored in the refrigerator. Prolonged exposure to direct sunlight should be avoided. Syringes should be stored in a vertical position with the needle pointed up, up to avoid clumping of suspended insulin in a pre-filled syringe. Before injection, gently roll pre-filled syringes between the palms 10 to 20 times to warm the insulin. Routine doses of insulin are usually administered by subcutaneous injections. Regular insulin can be given IV when immediate onset of action is desired, as in the diabetic complications, DKA and HHS. Regular insulin is the only insulin which is given intravenously. Insulin is not taken orally because it, is, it can get inactivated or it gets inactivated by the gastric juices. The speed with which peak serum concentrations are reached varies with the anatomical site for anatomic site for injection. The fastest subcutaneous absorption is from the abdomen, followed by the arm, thighs, and the buttocks. Although the ab abdomen is the preferred injection site, other sites are appropriate for insulin injections. Caution the patient about injecting into a site that is to be exercised. For example, the patient should not inject insulin into the thigh and then go jogging. Exercise of the area containing the injection site together with the increased body heat and circulation generated by the exercise may increase the rate of absorption and speed, the, and speed up the onset of insulin action. Teach patients to rotate site within one anatomic site such as the abdomen for at least one week before using a different site such as the right thigh. This allows for better insulin absorption. For example, it may be helpful to think of the abdomen as a checkerboard with each half inch square representing an injection site. Injections are rotated systematically across the board with each injection site at least half to one inch away from the previous injection site. Abdomen is the preferred site, but arms, thighs, and back can be used. Patient can also rotate within each side by using this checkerboard pattern as noted in this figure. Most commercial insulin is available 
as 100 units indicating that 1 ml contains 100 units of insulin. Disposable plastic syringes, insulin syringes are also available in various sizes including 1.5 and 0.3 ml. Perform injections at 45 to 90 degree angle depending on the thickness of the patient's fat pad. An insulin pen is a compact portable device loaded with an insulin cartridge that serves the same function as a needle and syringe. <coughs> Many patients prefer using insulin pens because of the greater convenience and flexibility. Insulin pump. Continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion can be administered with an insulin pump, which is a small battery operated device. Most insulin pumps are worn on the belt or under clothing and loaded with rapid acting insulin, which is connected via plastic tubing to a catheter inserted into the subcutaneous tissue in the abdominal wall. All insulin pumps are programmed to deliver a continuous infusion of rapid acting insulin 24 hours a day, known as a basal rate. The basal insulin can be temporarily increased or decreased on the basis of carbohydrate intake, activity changes, or illnesses. Some individuals require different basal rates at different times of the day. At mealtime, the user programs the pump to deliver a bolus infusion of insulin appropriate to the amount of carbs ingested and an additional amount if needed. Insulin pump users must check their blood glucose level at least four times per day. A major advantage of insulin pump is the potential for tight glucose control. This is big possible because insulin delivery becomes very similar to the normal physiological pattern. Insulin Corporation produces an insulin pump that is tubing free system. The insertion site is changed every two to three days to avoid site infection and to promote good insulin absorption pump offers the benefit of a more normal lifestyle allowing users more flexibility with meal and activity pattern. The problems associated with the insulin therapy include hypoglycemia, allergic reactions, lipodystrophy and the Samogi effect. Local inflammatory reactions to insulin may occur such as itching, erythema and burning sensation around the injection site. Local reactions may be self-limiting within one to three months or may improve with a low dose of antihistamine. A true insulin allergy is rare. It is manifested by a systemic response with urticaria and possibly anaphylactic shock. Lipodystrophy may occur if the same injection sites are used frequently. Hypertrophy, a thickening of the subcutaneous tissue, eventually regresses if the patient does not use the site for at least six months. The use of hypertrophied sites may result in erratic insulin absorption. Hyperglycemia in the morning may be due to the Somogi effect. A high dose of insulin produces a decline in blood glucose levels during the night. As a result, counter-regulatory hormones are released like glucagon, epinephrine growth hormone and cortisol, stimulating lipolysis, gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis which in turn produces reborn hyperglycemia. If a patient is experiencing morning hyperglycemia, checking blood glucose levels between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. for hypoglycemia will help determine if the cause is a Samogi effect. The patient may report headaches on awakening and may recall having night sweats or nightmares. A bedtime snack, a reduction in the dose of insulin, or both can help to prevent the Samogi effect. And finally, the dawn phenomenon. The dawn phenomenon is also characterized by hyperglycemia that is present on awakening. The treatment for Samogi effect is less insulin, whereas the treatment for dawn phenomenon is an increase in insulin or an adjustment in the administration time. Ask the patient to measure and document bedtime, nighttime, which is between 2 and 4 a.m., and morning fasting blood glucose levels on several occasions. If the pre-dawn levels are less than 60 and signs, of, signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia are present, the insulin dosage should be reduced. If the 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. blood glucose level is high, the insulin dosage should be increased. In addition, counsel the patient on appropriate bedtime snacks.